Hello, and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. Perhaps no country in the world today is suffering as much as its youngest country, South Sudan. South Sudan has been caught in a grip of a civil war since 2015, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands and forcing over two million to flee as refugees to neighboring Kenya and Uganda. To tell us more about this tragic situation, and yet the work of the Catholic Church to try and provide some measures of peace and hope, it is my great privilege to welcome His Excellency Bishop Emeritus Parid Taban Kenyi of South Sudan. Your Excellency, welcome and thank you for being with us here today in our program. Well, thank you very much, Mark for welcoming me here. Your Excellency, the war in South Sudan has been going on since 2015. Can you give us a little bit of a context, a picture about what provoked this war and what is the situation today? The war today in South Sudan, for me, is more painful than all the wars which had taken place from 1955 to 1972. Why more painful? Yeah, because these are brothers. I don't like to say sisters. The women are really innocent. They are suffering with their own children. It is war or fight between brothers and brothers. And this, we never expected all this to happen because the first war was like the slavery. The first war was the war against the, the North. The, the North, which like we considered, we in the South considered, that like getting out of the Israelis from Egypt, from the slavery in Egypt. That because is, it was, just to recap, the war that was 20 years from the North, which was Arab and Muslim, against the South, black Christian. Is that very, I know it's well, very, very broad, but- Yeah, we said so, hmm. uh, because when you say Arabs, were some Arabs who, are, who would not be happy to hear that the war was Arabs. When we say also Islam, they say, the Islam say, we are not really all involved in this. But this is the Khartoum regime, the ruling party. And this is all power. And uh, I look at it like all this war had been power. And even today, war is power. So this war was 22 22 years, and then in 2011 was independence of South Sudan, and this was supposed to be the new beginning. The South would have been very happy, because many, many rejoice to have seen them, what their grand-grandparents were expecting. They are lucky that they have seen it. And everybody was hoping in the history of South Sudan to see the independence of South Sudan. I can tell you for myself, I never voted in South Sudan, nor in Sudan. I voted only once for the independence of South Sudan. And now this war, a civil war, is that much more painful because it is, as you say, between the brothers. It is between the brothers. Mm. It is more painful and it is also a struggle for power. I thought liberation was not power. Liberation was to free your brothers, your sisters from slavery and not to get into power. It, you, it is in the Old Testament we have prophets. After liberating their people, when the people were free, 
they went back to work in their farms. They have already done their work. Here, you are free. Enjoy yourself. But not to say, I have fought. Yes, for whom? For yourself or for others? For your brothers? For your sisters? Not for your own self. And that is the most important. But today, even people talking in Addis Ababa, they talk about power sharing. Not liberating people from their suffering. They speak more on power sharing. Who will be the president? Who will be prime ministers? Who will be that? And so on. It's power sharing. And this we is... thought after the independence, we should have turned all our guns into plow. Into plowshares. Share, not into fight. Into fighting. We weapons. don't need to fight. Family don't need to fight to, against each other. You cannot solve the problem of the family by guns. People have families. You sit down and settle among yourself and solve it. It's not by gun. I tell you, when the war started in South Sudan, I was a good hunter. I had guns for a big animal like elephant. I have four small animals, I have four guinea fowls. But when the war started, I destroyed all my guns. Because I don't like it to fall into the hand of anybody for killing any South Sudanese. I destroyed them. How much of the war, it has been alleged that the war is about power, it's about money, it's about the oil? Yeah, it is greed. And greed. Then Gandhi said clearly that we have enough in this world to meet every man's need, but not enough to meet even one man's greed. And this is what is happening today. The South Sudan has enough to meet every South Sudanese need, and even the region of Africa, and even war has enough. But this is not enough even to meet any greed of these people who are hungering for power. Otherwise, we don't need, we will be supplying the whole world with the food. Yes, it, it's wealthy in enough. South Sudan would have been the breadbasket for the whole world. We could provide rice all over the world. If you see our swampy area for rice, we have gold. People are collecting gold from the rivers. And this is all the wealth of the nation. Should have been protected by those who are now fighting for power. Some would suggest that this power and politicization has come into the ethnic level, has come down onto, there are approximately 64, over 60, if I'm reading correctly, different ethnic groups and tribes. Is this true? Has it come down now into the level of the different, different ethnic? And how do you see this on a day-to-day -day level? It is agreed with blindfolded people to look into ethnic. All South Sudanese, when you go very carefully, they are related. They are correlated. They are co-related. Co-related. Either through marriage, through neighbors, they are mostly correlated. I myself today, I, it is very dangerous for me to speak about any tribe. Why? Because one of my knees is married to a Dinka and another to a Nuer. There are others married to different tribes. And this, the, the, all their children are calling me uncle. And I cannot speak against my nephews. I'm afraid to say anything about any tribe because one of my nephews said, uncle, why do you talk like that against me? I want to talk about another poison and that was a poison that was supposed to bring wealth to the country and that is oil. You have been gifted with so much wealth and one of these wealths is, is naturally oil with a projected 350,000 barrels a day. Has yeah. it been a curse, this? this, this? You, are, you are talking to someone who campaigned to stop the drilling of the oil 
in the year 2000, I was the president of the New Sudan Council of Churches. We formed a group called Ecumenical Forum all over the world. We tried to stop the drilling of the oil because the money was being used for finishing the people in South Sudan and in Sudan. We managed. Talisman had to quit. We campaigned and went to all the part of the world telling the Shell Mobile not to buy this oil. We managed to stop that with the talisman who were drilling. A Canadian company. The Canadian company. They had to withdraw because we say that you cannot climb the tree while it is being cut and you fall and fall into the sea. So they managed to leave because the oil became by then a curse for finishing the life of the people of South Sudan. We managed to campaign against that. And that is what I want to tell you that from the very beginning, from 1983 onward, the oil became a curse for finishing the life of people instead of building the people. Today, I've been in, in Austria. I've been in Netherlands getting the award. You see, peaceful, the money, everything has been. Today, the South will be like German. The South will be built like Austria. The South will be built like all the Netherlands because of this wealth. How many are illiter approximately percentage? I don't like to, to say much. Some people who may be calling the same professors or doctors will say you are a liar. In some areas... It's very high. In some areas it is 95% in some areas or even 98% in some areas. People are living still as God has created them. The time of one day I was driving with some Dutch people going to see the peace village. They saw men going naked, completely naked. They said, wow, Bishop, what is that? I, what are these? I said, these are children of God. What? I said, these are children of God. And if these are children of God, what are we? I said, we are children of Adam and Eve. <laughs> Very good. So this yes, is... Yes, I understand. If people want to exploit people, they have to keep them ignorant so that they can do what they want with them. They will not like people to know their right. That's why for me, I campaign for education starting from nursery school, from education. Today, the most important thing in South Sudan is education. The challenge has been with the war today, the number of refugees. I believe, if the numbers are correct, 1.2 million internally displaced and about 2 million South Sudanese who have now fled, going to Uganda, to Kenya, to neighboring countries, seeking refuge there. What is the impact in the country, the long-term impact of these people who are leaving the country? And what is life for these people like who have left and are living now in these refugee camps all around Africa? Well, we talk about refugees. We talk about those in the UN camps. We forget to talk about those even in the city of Juba, eating in the garbage. They live by eating in the garbage. Nobody talking about this. These are everywhere. Not even Juba. I went to Wau. I went to Malagar. I saw all this. These people who are eating in the garbage within the town are forgotten. They, you don't know how can they survive. This is one of the things which keep me, I have faith, that God is present. Because these people would not be alive today if God was not there. 
people see how God takes care of the birds of the air and also how it takes care of these people. They don't have a store, they don't have kitchen, they come every evening with something and they stay in the cemetery. Their town is the cemetery. So nobody talks about this. And so those refugees, I have been in the refugees camp. I nearly said yes. First, they don't have enough land. What they eat is too little. The youth are traumatized. They have gone into alcohol. What moral life? Where is the future of our country? Where is the future of South Sudan? People are traumatized. They have gone into our drugs. And we need a lot of people for counseling, for trauma healing. In the, not only inside the South Sudan, but even in the refugees camps. You spoke about a lack of food. In 2017, there was a famine, and there is a risk of a greater famine in this year. Economy is very... What somebody may get from government salary today, or any money, cannot leave, make somebody live for two, three days. The salary of one month cannot keep somebody alive for one or two, three days. Because of inflation? Inflation is high. And then, not only, there are people today in the government up to now have not received the salary of this year. They might have received the one of last year. Even you can ask somebody who is working, a minister, you say, I have not received even my salary of this year. But they, because they want to keep the government, to keep the country, they sacrifice their life. It is a sacrifice. Many people went to refugees camp, not only from war, but economy, economical problem. And this made many, many leave the country to go to refugees camp. It is not the war, economical problem. If I understand correctly, even some are going back to the north where they fled because of the economic situation in the south. I think Khartoum must be happy. It is a mockery. Before you talk against somebody, today you are coming back. It is, it is, now, and, and Khartoum welcomes them. Come on, you went by yourself, but we didn't chase you, come. One thing is to stand by and watch, but are they actively destabilizing as well? I don't know what, whatever is, but I know that everybody is, today you find Khartoum, today you come in South, today you hear that there are some, Rebel being supported by Khartoum today, you don't understand. The role. I don't live by rumors. I don't, uh, because when I said, say, how do you prove? I cannot prove anything. But uh, that's for me, I cannot talk very much about those. But the situation is there. And I think one of the things I have to tell clearly is that the world is not united. In 2005, you retired from your Episcopal activities to start a peace village, the Holy Trinity Peace Village in Kuron. This was at the height of the North-South War. Why did you decide to set up a peace village? As I said, during the war, I saw that even the war in South Sudan went too long because of divide and rule pitch one tribe against another, one community against another. We say, if we want to stop this kind of thing, to unite the people, to start a peace village, where I told you already, where I grew up, the British brought the families from all over the Sudan, 
my parents were among those. I'm very happy. I grew with different culture, way of thinking than tribal way. And then I went to Israel two times. When I used to be tired, I go to pray in the tomb of Jesus. And I went to Nova Salom, where there is this cooperative village, where the Jews, the Christian, the Israelis live together. The Muslim, they live together in a cooperative village. I said, I would find one like this. And that's why I was watching. When the war was about to stop, they were going to sign the peace. In Nairobi. I was the one who said the first prayer for signing the peace in Naivasha. And then I wrote to the Holy Father to resign. How many are you now? We started the village with about 18, 81 families. But now we are surrounded by over 20,000 people. 20,000 people. Around, but the area where we are working is a county which has got 50, 2,000 people. There are no any other people who can give service in the area. So they come to you? They come, clinic, we have only one clinic. We have one school for boarding. We have nearly 300 children in the boarding school. We have, in the clinic, they come. And then we open also vocational training because the youth who are raiding cattle, they say, but how can we survive? Because we want the cattle for a bright price. We say, why don't you produce furniture and sell and you buy your cows? What would you say has been your greatest joy in, within this whole development of the peace village? My greatest joy is to see people who call themselves enemies are calling themselves friends. My greatest joy is when these people say, he made us human being. And my greatest joy is to be like them, among them, for them, in them, with them. This is what gives you hope. That is what makes me happy. Where there's good, there's also evil. Have you been attacked? Have you been threatened? Have you been persecuted for this effort that you're trying to do? So far, nobody has come openly. Instead, we have many from different states. There are areas where the political leaders in some states, like in Pibo, they had some misunderstanding. They came and solved it in Kuron Peace Village. So it's, it's become a place for, for reconciliation. For reconciliation. Now, we want to make it a peace academy where we can invite people to set their, settle their problem. Except we don't have enough room to accommodate people. We are trying. So that is what is happening. People are happy. And I'm happy that even though I go to Juba, everybody, when they see, oh, Bishop Taban, even if I invite you now to go to South Sudan, they say, this is a visitor of Bishop Taban. Immediately, nobody will even check you are back. And that means that everybody is happy. Everyone in South Sudan doesn't like war. But they have no way how to, how to, get, out. How to get out of this. This is what I can summarize. Everybody in South Sudan is hungry for peace. But they don't know how to get out of it. And that is what we are praying for, that may God open the heart of people. Today, there's nobody in South Sudan who like war. That's why when people go to Addis, you hear people talk about position, about this. But instead say, put all the arms down, let us stop war, and start work. And, but fear, you know, there is one thing, Jesus said, don't be afraid, it is fear. I have my words here, which I say, if people say, I can summarize only this part here, you say, 
just I love you. I, I start with joy, love, joy, peace, patience, compassion, sympathy, kindness, truthfulness, gentleness, self-control, humility, poverty, forgiveness, mercy, friendship, trust, unity, purity, faith, hope. I love you. I miss you. Thank you. I forgive. We forget together. I am wrong. I am sorry. These are the points needed. If people just have courage to live that, to live this, 28 words, only this. There are more, but these 28 are the best. I am, I miss you. I love you. I miss you. Thank you. I forgive. We forget. Together, I am wrong. I am sorry. Thank you, Your Excellency, for having been with us today in our program. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today in our program, Where God Weeps. And if you'd like to know more about the Holy Trinity Peace Village in Kuran, in South Sudan, and the work of His Excellency Bishop Parid Taban Kenyi, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.